Toronto. Uh, my name is Edward Schatz. I'm the acting director of the Centre for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Um, before I hand the floor over to my colleague, Professor Alexander Reisenbüchler, to introduce today's esteemed, uh, esteemed guest, uh, let me say a few words about this series which we at Saris are celebrating today. This is the second annual lecture of the Daniel and Elizabeth Damov Lecture in European Affairs. Our first was in March 2019, which seems like a very long time ago, when we hosted Professor Christian Lecane from Sciences Po in Paris. We had planned to, that today's speaker, Dr. Constanza Schwenzenmuller, would join us physically in Toronto uh, in May for this lecture. Uh, well, we all know what happened. And so we decided not to delay. And so here we are, of course, on Zoom, as we are for many other kinds of um, uh, events in our lives these days. The series is sponsored by a long and dear friend of Saris and its predecessor, Kreis, the Center for Russian and, Euro uh, and East European Studies, Mr. Daniel Damov. Since the 1990s, Mr. Damov and his late wife, Elizabeth, again, long cherished friends of Saris and the Monk School, have been enthusiastic supporters of our small but dynamic Bulgarian Studies program. The program provides student exchanges, visiting scholars, and the distinguished, lecture, uh, distinguished leaders in Bulgaria lecture series that Dan set up with uh, our colleague here, Robert Austin. And so today we have this truly visionary series, again, based on Dan's generosity. The lecture and its focus, focus on Europe, captures Dan and Elizabeth's beliefs and their origins. Dan and Elizabeth met in France after the Second World War. Dan from Bulgaria, Elizabeth from Germany. They were at the preliminary session of the College of Europe in Bruges. Dan was the only Bulgarian, as I understand it, having fled the communist takeover. And Dan has said that they were guinea pigs for the building of the new Europe in the war's aftermath. Both Dan and Elizabeth became great Canadians and made extraordinary contributions to this country, but they also remained dedicated to their roots. They were firm believers in European integration, the European idea, and the promise of peace and prosperity. Elizabeth was especially proud of the role that the Federal Republic of Germany played after the war. Dan envisioned this lecture series as a way to honor their commitment to a new Europe and to educate others about Europe's great achievements after the Second World War. Mr. Damoff, thank you so very much for the support that you have provided us and that you continue to provide us. It's really most welcome. So let me um, introduce uh, Professor Reisenbichler, uh, who will in turn introduce our guest, Constanza. Um, uh, uh, and Professor Reisenbichler will moderate the discussion. Um, I uh, unfortunately have another obligation and will stay as long as I can, but uh, for, uh, the, the discussion will be in able hands with Professor Reisenbichler. Briefly about Alex, Alexander Reisenbichler is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at, here at the University of Toronto. He's also research coordinator of the Joint Initiative in German and European Studies at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Next year, he will be either a virtual or a physically present fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard University. Terrific colleague, uh, terrific scholar and political economist. Alex, uh, over to you to introduce our, uh, our guest for today's lecture. Thank you very much, Ed. It is now my pleasure to introduce the distinguished speaker of this year's Damov Lecture. Dr. Constanze Stelzenmüller. She's currently a senior fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC, where she's a leading expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign policy. In the past, she was also a Kissinger Chair on Foreign Policy and International Relations at the Library of Congress, the inaugural Robert Bosch Senior Fellow, and editor of the German newspaper Die Zeit, and held multiple positions with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Her writing has appeared in media outlets, including Foreign Affairs, The Financial Times, The International New York Times, and Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany. And I especially like her contributions to The Financial Times that I would like to point out. And she's also a regular on prominent German, European, and American political radio and television shows. Um, 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 and she holds a PhD in law from the University of Bonn, 
in Germany and as well as a master's degree from the Harvard Kennedy School. And today she will be talking about the West and the transatlantic relationship in a post-pandemic order. And this topic is, of course, very important because a strong transatlantic relationship has been a core element of the post-war liberal order. But in recent years, some have diagnosed growing transatlantic rifts, as well as cracks in the foundations of the liberal order. And today you will be hearing from a true transatlanticist on these matters. As our speaker is not only an expert on transatlantic politics and relations, but also someone who has lived a transatlantic experience, having both lived and worked on both sides of the Atlantic in Germany and the United States. Um, before we begin, just two quick notes to the audience. Um, please use the Q&A tool if you have any questions for the speaker, as we will have time for a Q&A after the talk, which I will be moderating. And also note that this event is being recorded and will be posted online in a few days. Um, Thank you very much for being here, uh, Dr. Stelzmüller. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me and see me well? I'm assuming yes. You are all muted, but um, I guess it's okay. Yes, I see. I see a thumbs up. All right, wonderful. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Eisenbichler, Alexander, for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you to the Monk School for hosting me. I would much rather be with you in Toronto. Uh, I was really, really sad when I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do this because I enjoy coming to uh, Canada and Toronto is a wonderful city. Um, I also want to say uh, how grateful I am to Mr. Damov for funding this lecture series on such an important topic. Um, many of you may have heard of the only um, movie made in the 1940s to get Canada into the war, the 49th parallel. Um, it's, uh, it was made by a, a, a British filmmaker together with an emigre Hungarian Jew, Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. Um, and I think that, I, I gather a lot of Canadians know this movie, but you may not know another one by, by the same couple of filmmakers from 1946, which is my favorite movie, and it's called A Matter of Life and Death. And it's a metaphysical romance between an American a British uh, fighter pilot, an American whack, um, and it is, among other things, about the transformational effect that uh, the transatlantic relationship can have on individual lives. There is a wonderful trial scene set in heaven where they defend their, uh, their relationship. Um, I'm only saying all this to make you curious and to look it up. It's one of the greatest movies ever made, in my view. And I think that what Mr. Damov and I share is the, is the transformational experience that moving across the Atlantic can give to your lives. And at the same time, being, being profoundly rooted in our European history and committed to the European project. So I appreciate um, your commitment, sir, particularly. Um, I'm really grateful like people, that, that people like you are doing this kind of thing. And again, uh, I was told before we jumped on this call that um, had I come in person, we would have had dinner together and that you're keeping up this commitment and I will hold you to it. I really look forward to meeting you all. Now, it's a great honor to be invited to reflect before uh, you all and, and, and your audience um, on the future of Europe uh, in, in and after the pandemic. Um, but I do want to say, that I'm also mindful, uh, as I speak to you, of a saying by, by the great uh, German-Jewish philosopher Ernst Bloch, that history unfolds in the darkness of the lived moment. And I think rarely has that warning been as true as it, as it is now. So if I make, um, if I speak to you now, I, I am asking myself, what I will think of my remarks in six months. Um, I'll be able to tell you in six months. Maybe we'll meet for dinner then. 
I want to talk about three questions in particular. The first one is the consequences of the pandemic for geopolitics, or to put it more simply, the way we think about the world. My second section will be about the US elections and their potential impact on the transatlantic relationship. We're now 20 days out from this momentous event. And my third section of remarks will be on the implications of all this for Europe and uh, including my own country, Germany. And I'd like to end with some thoughts about what a new transatlantic bargain could look like. So let me start with the consequences of this pandemic for geopolitics. Now, some of you may occasionally check, as I do, the Johns Hopkins coronavirus dashboard. Um, it's a sad sight, and it's been getting sadder by the day. We have 38 million cases worldwide, a million dead. And as we all know, we are now at the beginning of a second wave, um, both in the United States and in Europe. This pandemic is also the third global shock since the turn of the century, after the attacks on, uh, on America of 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis. And I think arguably in retrospect, we will see that this pandemic is a greater shock than either of these two, because it is what a colleague of mine, Thomas Wright, has called a massive multi-crisis of all our systems, our societies, our health systems, our economies, our national politics and institutions, our alliances, and our global order. And of course, we, we know that this may yet take many months to be over. We, we are already seeing historic recessions, spiking joblessness, and spiking poverty rates. The ultimate effect of all this has still not unfolded. Now, I don't think that this pandemic will end globalization or destroy the international order, but what it certainly has already done is to show up our weaknesses and divisions. But at the same time, I think it has also imposed some corrections on how we think about global order. And I want to, I want to raise that briefly. Before the pandemic, there was something of a consensus in international thinking about the world that the world had moved from a collaborative, liberal, rules-based order to one that was marked by great power competition and state sovereignty, a state and sovereignty of great powers in particular that could uncouple from, from world order if they so chose. And I think what the pandemic has shown us is two things. One is that even for great powers and the superpower, interdependence is real. Viruses don't care about power. They're not particularly interested in state sovereignty. And it's really helpful if we can collaborate internationally to combat it. The second lesson, I think, is that what does matter is good governance and the earned trust of citizens. In that sense, I think we can see that our main, the main challengers of the West, Russia and China, have both had rather bad pandemics. Yes, China's growth rates are going back up, but the pandemic has shown a really sharp light on the ruthlessness and brutality with which China cracked down on its own hotspots, with which it lied to its own citizens and the rest of the world about the extent of the pandemic at the beginning. And of course, all this is happening at the same time as the West is growing increasingly concerned about China's horrific mistreatment of its minorities, in particular a million Uyghurs who are in labor camps in, in Western China, and its threats uh, and, and crackdowns on Hong Kong and, and against Taiwan. Russia, I would say, has been even more destabilized 
we're seeing a Russian president who is clearly on the defensive, not just about the demonstrations in his own country in Eastern Russia and in Siberia in particular, but who was also badly wrong-footed by the endurance of protesters in Belarus, and equally badly wrong-footed by the very sharp European and indeed German reactions to the poisoning of Alexei Navalny in Siberia, and now the imposition of sanctions. That said, Russia and China are not the only ones who've had a bad pandemic. We've seen that some of the oldest Western democracies, the United States and, and the UK, have been genuinely struggling with the political and government reaction to this. And the same, more or less, is true of democracies across Europe, with some interesting differences. Let me move now from this to the US elections and transatlantic relations. Some of you will have seen last night's competing town halls, which um, took place because instead of uh, the originally scheduled debate between um, Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, because Mr. Trump um, because basically uh, neither were, uh, Mr. Trump was, was not willing to submit to the, to the conditions. And we've already, seen the, we've already seen the comparisons to Mr. Rogers versus the Joker um, in the Twitter sphere. Um, let's, let's just say that, that one debate was not very edifying and the other one was so edifying that um, it was almost a little concerning. The one thing I think that is clear now, less than three weeks before the election, is that the preservation of social peace and political peace in America hinges on two things. An above average voter turnout, and that already seems to be happening. 15 million Americans have already voted, often in person, but also on a fast and clear outcome. That's not impossible. There are certain states like Florida that the president has to win if he is to be given a second term. And if he does not win Florida, which counts its votes early in election night, then he will have lost the vote. But while that's a possible outcome, it is not the most likely one. And what is equally likely at least is a prolonged period of uncertainty and political chaos, a constitutional conflict that would have to be resolved by Congress or the Supreme Court, and that such a situation could um, bring with it the potential for destructive meddling, either by external powers or by domestic extremists is nothing that I need to explain to you. So, well, I have to say, I can't wait for election day, although I'm a German citizen and I can't vote. I'm also still deeply worried about what comes after that. Let me move now to what a second term term or a um, Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States would mean for America and for the transatlantic relationship. We've already seen now four years of Trump, and those of us who argued from the beginning, and I have to say I was one of them, uh, in fact, I wrote an essay called Normal is Over, who argued against the normalization of this president by institutions and by the political caste have, I'm sad to say, been proven correct. So we know what would come in a second administration. We would see a continuation of this ruthless America first policy in an ethno-nationalist framework, but with even less checks and balances by the institutions. There would be an increasing role for family and loyalists and a an continued decline of the power bureaucracies. The GOP would continue to self-radicalize 
And all this would weaken US governance and legit legitimacy at a time when the world is in turmoil. And would we, we would see, I'm quite certain, a continued transactional and in many cases even hostile attitude to American alliances and Europe in particular. And as we now know from the room where it happened, the book by John Bolton, the former national security advisor, Trump was far closer to taking the United States out of NATO than people were willing to believe at the time. And I think it is entirely possible that that would come on the menu again. Now, what if the 46th president of the United States is called Joseph Biden? I think many of us, me included, know his large and hyper-competent foreign and security policy team. Biden himself and the, his senior advisors, many, many of the people around him, are Americans who grew up with the notion that American leadership in the world was not just a privilege, but a duty, a responsibility, engendered by America's superpower status. And I am absolutely certain, again, based on my knowledge of the people who work for him, that they understand the worth of America's alliances and would treat allies with respect and warmth. But the world has changed and America has changed and not just in the last four years. And on that point, I suspect there may be some differences within the Biden camp. My colleague at Brookings, Tom Wright, has written eloquently about the restorationists versus the reformers and the differences between them. I, this is not the place to go into that. We might want to do that in discussion. But the point I want to make is that in any case, a Biden administration would have a huge repair job at home, one that would dwarf the, the job faced by Barack Obama at the height of the global financial crisis in 2009. Some of you will recall the famous Onion headline. The Onion is this satir satirical little newspaper in Washington. And the headline on the day of Barack Obama's inauguration said, black man gets worse job in America. Well, this would be that, but larger and more complex by dimensions. And I think a President Biden would face a radicalized opposition from the conservative camp that also would make the Freedom Caucus and the Tea Party of the early 2000s seem like Sunday morning softball practice in the park. All that would mean that a Biden administration would have little bandwidth for foreign and security policy, an inclination to focus on China as the main threat, as the main threat, and a real need for allies to pick up a greater share of the burden one that I have to say that I sympathize with greatly. Now let me come to my, the third part of my remarks, which is the consequences and lessons for Europe of all this. I've been living in Washington for the last nearly six years, um, but I, before the pandemic, was in Europe six or eight times a year, not just in my own country, Germany, but in other European capitals, because I've always found it necessary um, to make sure that I understood the complexities of the European political choir. And it's often instructive for a German to hear how we're perceived in other countries in Europe, whether in the north, the east, the south, or, or, or to the west of us. And Europe now faces a situation that is about as dire as, as it's been since the end of World War II. Global problems like climate change and pandemics and others, of course, continue to call for international cooperation. The pandemic raises the threat of humanitarian crises, resource wars, and mass migration movements in ways that I think we have not begun to be able to calculate yet. Those will unfold over the coming years. And we're seeing a globalization on the, defense, on the defensive 
and truly in need of regulation and containment at the same time that interdependence continues, not least because of the incredibly fast pace of technological innovation. Niklas Eisenstadt, um, the uh, scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, wrote a searing, um, very imaginative article about the world, the post-pandemic world, a couple months ago, in which, he, in which he called this the specter of integration without global solidarity. And we're also seeing, of course, a worldwide crisis of governance and trust. What does that mean for Europe's relations with the great powers? Now, as we all know, Europeans wanted the Russians and the Chinese to be strategic partners. And we wanted them, based on what we like to call the convergence theory, because we, had, we thought we had won the Cold War after 1989, and the fall of the wall, we thought that they would gravitate towards the West and thereby transform and be more like us. Now we see that Russia and China are our strategic challengers, and not just in the Middle East and in the Pacific, where the EU does have real strategic interests, not just in terms of trade um, or labor migration, but also in terms of its security. But we're also seeing them as increasingly assertive and aggressive actors within the European space, where they're competing in our physical, economic, social, political, and digital spaces for power and for influence. Russia, in search of spheres of influence and, and in, in, in an attempt to delegitimize the West, culturally and ideologically. China, in search of a global dominance, a, an end to the American age, and aggressively in search of physical and digital economic assets to incorporate into an ever denser global network. And in all this, we've seen in the, under the Trump administration, um, a United States mutating from a protector, friend and partner to what my colleague Bob Kagan has called a rogue superpower. One that sees its allies as objects of American protection, um, an American protection that has to be paid for. He seems to think of NATO as something like a country club where if you don't pay your dues, you get, to, you get kicked out. So in sum, great power competition is not ta just taking place within the world. It's taking place in Europe, over Europe, about Europe, and includes our ally, the United States, at least under Trump. That, all of that, all of what I've just described, amounts to the perfect geostrategic storm for Europe, which of course depends on an open, free, and rules-based international order like no other region in the world. Now, um, this is the place to say that I think we've made some fairly significant contributions to our own dilemma. The Eurozone crisis, the Ukraine crisis, the refugee crisis, Brexit, all of these speak to our own weaknesses of political will and capability, and they have all weakened the European project's effectiveness and legitimacy in the eyes of the world and indeed of, of our own citizens. And we were also seeing truly disturbing signs of a struggling democratic governance and trust within our own nation states in Europe, um, as evidenced by the rise of populists, authoritarians, and ethno-nationalists, and in some places, they're in fact in government, like in Hungary. And when Russia, China, and the Trump administration exploit these weaknesses, they're only exploiting weaknesses that we ourselves have created and are responsible for. Um, now, before all of you go and you know, pour yourself a glass of whiskey and drown your sorrows, I do want to say that I see, and it's a bit maybe early in the morning in Toronto to do that, um, although I'm sure Canadians are very hardy and can handle it, um, I do see grounds for optimism. 
For one, I think that the new European Commission, which took on its work in 2019 under the German former defense minister Ursula von der Leyen, um, is, has a fairly accurate sense of its remit and what it needs to do. You know that it's called itself a geopolitical commission. One of the key geo strategy papers, the, the first ones the commission put out, called China a strategic rival. Stunning a lot of people in Beijing. My second sign for optimism is this massive European recovery package agreed by governments in July after much wrangling. But that, I think, is a sign that we Europeans have understood just how serious our situation is. And finally, I'm also very encouraged by European and indeed German reactions to the recent activities of Russia and China in Europe. Um, the, you know that Merkel invited N Navalny to be treated at the Charité Hospital in Berlin, and subsequent, subsequently, Germany has led the effort for, for some really harsh sanctions on uh, the Russian leadership, leadership including uh, on the head of the FSB. And the Chinese foreign minister uh, on a recent trip through Europe, including Berlin, got an earful to his, uh, to his surprise, I think, about Chinese uh, aggressive diplomacy in Europe recently, the so-called wolf, wolf diplomacy. And all of this, I think, is a welcome change in Europe's willingness to defend itself. Still, the challenges are very real. And if there were to be a second Trump administration, I think they would be compounded. And in all this, I think it helps us to remember as we, as we wonder, as we sometimes ask ourselves, ask ourselves whether this European project can endure under such conditions, it does help to remember the reasons why the European project was created in the first place. And by the way, of course, with, European, with, with US benevolent support from the beginning and throughout the decades, of the Cold War and the 30 years thereafter. There would not have been a Europe whole and free and no German reunification without American leadership. And those three reasons were peace, prosperity, and democratic transformation between 1945 and 89, and then again for 30 years after 1989 as we enlarged Europe's democratic remit. But as we see during this pandemic, and I think, as I think I've just made clear, those three rationales, peace, prosperity, and democratic transformation still hold. They're not history. It became fashionable a while ago to suggest that that was over and we needed to look for a new one. I'd say absolutely not. That is still what holds us together and what, when we make it work, makes us better. The global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, which then morphed into a Eurozone crisis in the following years, suggested a fourth rationale, which was protecting the open and rules-based order that is Europe against the storms of globalization. We needed to do more to make ourselves more resilient against the impact of such financial crises. There needed to be better rules, in other words. And I would say that this current phase we find ourselves in, the pandemic, suggests expanding this theme of protection and resilience to what has been called strategic sovereignty, by which I mean not, not strategic autonomy, which is a, a, a French buzzword that is a red flag for uh, a number of other Europeans, um, particularly the Eastern Europeans, but also for, I think, some in Berlin, not least the Chancellor. Um, I mean sovereignty not in the sense of Europe becoming autonomous um, in the alliance or decoupling from globalization, but what I do mean is that we need to work really hard to recover agency. And that agency for, for a deeply interdependent and vulnerable Europe that has indefensible borders, 
agency for Europe means that we can only be strong, that we can only survive together with each other and with our allies. And that means, I think, putting our own houses in order in ways that we have hitherto not really wanted to consider. And I think that includes repairing our own democratic orders. Let me finally move with just a handful of remarks to the question of a new transatlantic bargain. I will make this very brief. It's, I think, fairly obvious, although you do need, need to explain it to some younger Europeans and indeed Germans, why Europe needs America. If there were a massive European conflict on the scale of the world wars or on the scale of what was imagined as possible during the Cold War, Europe could not survive without America. That much is clear. But in a world where power is increasingly based on non-military source assets, in a world where conflict and friction are hybrid and perpetual, it becomes even more important for us to strive for order, for rules, and for a framework which helps us minimize this kind of continual conflict and friction. And again, for that, we need America but we need an America that is be willing to be a participant in this kind of endeavor. The more difficult question is why America needs Europe. And on the conservative of the uh, side of the aisle here in, in Washington, there have been some interesting reflections about that. Even on the conservative side of the aisle, there has been a recognition that in a great power world that is nonetheless deeply interdependent, America's power, even the power of the superpower, has become absolutely and relatively less. And that therefore allies are no longer optional, but necessary in order to leverage American strategic purposes. But if you read some of the more interesting younger conservative thinkers, you will find that the tone towards allies, particularly Europeans, is quite peremptory. It's basically, we are going to need you, yes, but we're willing to make you if we need to, which is not something that I think is going to work in Europe anymore with an administration that is somewhat more willing to consider the strengths of Europe that it can bring to the table, I think the tone would be quite different. And here the argument from Europe would be, what we have is trade superpower. What we have is an extraordinary regulatory power. And yes, we are still Western democracies. And that counts for something in a world of democratic recessions and where illiberalism is on the rise. And so in a world where we do need to rebuild a collaborative order, we still really are the best friends that America and I hope Canada could have. And again, the precondition though is, and that's a precondition that we didn't need to make 10 years ago 20 years ago, and certainly not 30 years ago in the triumphal mood after the fall of the war and the end of the Soviet Union. The precondition now is very much that we get our own houses in order on both sides of the Atlantic, because only then can we effectively and legitimately pretend to be a model to others. And with that, I'm going to stop. And thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Constanze, for a wonderful talk. I especially appreciated the notes on optimism, um, oh. the, the COVID rescue fund, and which is very, very uh, easy to forget uh, in these otherwise pretty dire times.
Um, let me remind the audience um, that you can submit questions again through the Q&A tool. I already see a host of questions that I will get to in a moment. But before we do so, Constance, I want to ask you a question to kick off the discussion, which is um, uh, a question about the EU, since this is also a lecture series on European affairs. And I wanted to ask you uh, whether you think that uh, what can only be considered a rocky relationship between the EU and the US at the moment, uh, whether this can force the European Union to cooperate more strongly in the realms of foreign and defense policy. And I'm thinking of Angela Merkel's comment um, um, uh, when she said something along the lines of, um, it's time for Europe to take its fate into, into its own hands. But then again, of course, for historical reasons, Germany is reluctant in assuming more power and, uh, and in the European Union and NATO. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on this are. Can, can the rocky relationship between the EU and the US produce more European integration and defense of foreign policy? Yeah, that would be a, a subject for an entire lecture in itself. Um, how do I say this? Um, Let me point out the obvious, which is that one of the ironies of the pandemic recessions in Europe is that we suddenly are looking much better at keeping our defense commitments. Germany has moved from 1.3% of GDP to 1.6 because the pandemic has reduced our GDP. So we're suddenly, I mean, we're still not at 2% as we promised in Wales, but we, we have until 2024 to reach that. And a point, point 0.4 differential doesn't look as difficult to reach anymore. But that's just, I mean, I say that in a sort of half joking way. The, The truth is that the defense and defense industrial cooperation within the NATO space is, is a genuinely devilish problem. And I personally think that the biggest wedge there is not so much political will or disagreements on the strategic purpose of the alliance within Europe or between America and Europe, but the insanely rapid pace of technological innovation and the fact that what used to be dumb pieces of iron that soldiers would lug around with them or drive around in now all have, have electronic components, which um, just reduce the life cycles of platforms and of kit. That makes the, the capability, that, that puts just an, a completely new twist on the capability differentials between the, between the United States and everybody else, or between the three great powers in Europe and, and all the others. And the truth is that, um, you know, not even the three great powers in Europe these days can, can afford um, full spectrum forces. So in this situation, it would certainly be helpful if we could agree on some transatlantic lighthouse projects. It would also be helpful if the United States didn't try to prevent European defense integration, as it has occasionally been known to do. But um, that's, you know, that, that's a discussion that we're only going to have with the Biden administration. With a second Trump administration, I think Europeans are going to have to ask themselves, what happens to the, who is going to be the backbone of NATO if America leaves? And what I can say to you is that I think that the recognition of that, that this is being recognized in, um, in Europe, and that I have to say that the current German defense minister, um, Annegret Kamkarnbauer, the she of the unpronounceable name, even more unpronounceable than mine, um, while she did a, a not great job as, as Angela Merkel's um, putative successor as party chief is doing a quite remarkable job as defense minister. 
I am seeing her pushing the envelope on, on military capabilities, on strategic thinking in ways that none of her predecessors did. And I think that that is, um, and particularly sending out the, the message to Europe's smaller powers that, that Germany is willing to serve as a backbone at least in, uh, obviously not, not in a sort of continent-wide conflagration, but in smaller to medium-sized operations, which is already a huge step. Sorry, that was a somewhat specialist answer. Um, I'm not sure whether I completely answered your question, but yeah, yes, okay. Yes, and you mentioned um, um, a possible Biden victory, and this is, um, mm. here's one question from the audience by a colleague, Professor Kazekamp. Um, I know Andres, hi Andres. <laughs> yes, Andres, exactly. Andres asks, uh, with a Biden victory, would there be any change in the relationship with some populist right-wing European governments, especially Hungary and Poland? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the $6 million question, isn't it? Um, I think I'm uh, not divulging any secrets when I say that I'm a member of a couple of working groups, uh, transatlantic working groups, writing papers. Um, and in fact, I've co-authored one on democracy in the alliance that we had a, a discussion on this morning at 8 a.m. So you're already my second engagement of the morning. And I think that there is a feeling that what's happening in Hungary and, and uh, to some degree in Poland is the rest of Europe's and is also America's and the Alliance's business because it undermines not just the functionality of NATO, the military and the legitimacy of NATO, the Alliance's military arm, but also undermines the transatlantic Alliance's political effectiveness and credibility. Now, the, there are zero, really, except there, there's the, the NATO treaty gives no enforceable hook for um, sanctioning democratic backsliding. The EU treaty does, and all of you will have seen how difficult that is. But I think there are many, many political ways of leveraging um, the joint assets, political assets that we have. After all, the Hungarians are very keen on EU cohesion funds. Presumably, they're also very keen on not being um, kicked out of meetings at NATO or on not having intelligence shared with them. And I think it needs to be pointed out to the Hungarians that their, their, their cozy relationships with Russia and China are under observation including by European and American um, intelligence agencies. Um, and the, the final point here is that we have seen, particularly in recent municipal elections in Hungary and in Poland, just how strongly um, the civil societies of these countries, and I might mention Turkey here as well, the NATO member, how strongly these societies rely on, on Western democracies to support them and protect them against the predations of their own governments. And so, Andreas, my, my answer to you is a resounding yes. Um, we're gonna have to figure it out, and some of this is tricky, but absolutely. Very good. Um, thank you for your answer. We have another question by another terrific, col terrific colleague, Randall Hansen, Professor Randall Hansen. Hi, Randall. Yes, you also know Randall. Um, sure. Um, so, Randall, if you allow me to rephrase your questions, how can the EU step up its game on the geopolitical stage when one of its most important members left the United Kingdom, especially one of its one of the members with with one of the most serious armed forces? So, how can the EU step up its geopolitical game with one of its key members leaving that had a, a serious armed forces? Yeah, that's another really hard conundrum, isn't it? Um, I think that particularly for Berlin and uh, some of the, I think the Dutch and the Nordics, the departure of, of Great Britain from the EU was a serious blow because it was seen as a counterweight to 
um, to particularly to to the French take on European strategic sovereignty, uh, French reservations with regard to NATO, as recently expressed in the famous Macron interview where he said that NATO was brain dead, which was um, considered by many diplomats, I think, as deeply unhelpful. Um, which, of course, is a euphemism. Um, and I, I, I'm dismayed by how the Brexit negotiations are going and how little attention we're paying to the question of how we construct a viable foreign and security policy that includes the Brits. Um, but I have to say that I'm also, that I think, you know, I'm happy to, to accept blame on the side of the commission, but I, but I am getting the distinct recent impression that Michel Barnier, the negotiator, does have the broad support of, of the continental European nations and the Irish. And that currently it's the Johnson government that is looking on the, very much on the defensive. And I wish that were not the case, frankly. But um, I think that what we're looking at is, is really not just a leadership issue, but a larger issue of governance in Britain that has created and also very polarized politics and, uh, and, uh, and a political and leadership culture that, whose issues go well beyond the personalities involved at the top. And th I mean, that's a concern to all of us. And I have to tell you, I, was, I happened to be in Berlin on the day of the, the Brexit vote and, and I woke up to the news and, and I, I mean, at the risk of sounding sentimental, I cried a bit in the shower in the morning and then um, took a bicycle in, 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 into the, the office that I was using at the Bosch Foundation at the time, uh, which is next to the foreign ministry. And as I got closer, um, in fact, in the Tiergarten, the central park of Berlin, I could see little groups of people, some of them that I knew, standing in animated discussion and, and discussing Brexit, you know, on their way to work. They had just stopped, they'd seen people that they knew and they, and, and they were standing there in the middle of the park or the road in, in, the, in, in central Berlin and, and, and saying, what are we going to do now? This was as though we had been struck by lightning. I'm never gonna forget that day. And, and I honestly, um, this is something that we need to fix. On on the subject of Brexit, uh, Sir Graham Watson, who is also a Monk Fellow, is asking a question about uh, that. Um, do you believe that Brexit may be the trigger for, or may have allowed a faster integration of the EU? Um, that's been speculated. And I think certainly, um, uh, Emmanuel Macron would, would love that. And I think that that was a hope in the Elysee and in the Quai d'Orsay um, that a, one of the prime obstacles against deeper integration would be removed. But I think that, I, 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 I have to say that I think that while I appreciate the, um, the willingness of, of Macron to think outside the box and the urgency of his proposals, and I, and I mean that, I'm not saying that with the, with the least element of snarkiness. I really do appreciate that because I find uh, Chancellor Merkel's incrementalism um, maddening often. And I, and, and I think that in, on key uh, issues, she's, she's been behind the curve on what needs to be done. But I think the, again and again, um, the, the, the Macron administration has, I think, failed to, to follow through with what needs to be done in a Europe of 27, which is convince your neighbors. And you're not going to convince the Eastern Europeans by saying that NATO is brain dead. And you're not going to convince um, anyone really 
by by not going around Europe and working relationships with leaders and with civil societies. That is not how Europe works anymore. A Franco-German tandem uh, with, I think, from the from the Paris uh, the perspective of Paris, the French uh, telling the the Germans how to execute their ideas. That just doesn't work anymore. And I think that the chancellor's method, as irritating as I often find it, of of patiently bridging um, quite fundamental divides on many of these issues of integration is will be more effective in the long run. So I think, I think frankly, we are going to see um, pragmatic levels of integration where we think that the changes in the geostrategic landscape require that. And two things that I could see are uh, a, a continuing um, integration of monetary union, banking union, this kind of thing, simply because the, the, the halfway house that we're in now is a vulnerability in itself, as we learned during the financial crisis. And secondly, I think there has to be uh, greater, uh, greater attention paid to the debilitating, destabilizing impacts of corrupt financial flows on our democracies and on our effectiveness and legitimacy and on external powers attempts to buy strategic companies, physical assets, uh, parts of the digital communication space um, that then are used to political purpose and turned against us. I think those are, those are levels where I think um, Europe needs to have a Europe-wide answer. Now, again, and this is sort of a technical point, but it's an important one. It's the choice we have here is either to push that up to Brussels and the EU Commission, in other words, to federalize the question, but there's also always the other choice of saying we leave this at an intergovernmental level, which is then maximizes national political sovereignty, but is also, as we know from council meetings, a hell of a lot of work. It's, it's frankly, it's, it's a trade-off where there's no one size fits all answer, but those are the two options. And I, I suspect we will be, uh, we're, we're not, I don't think we're heading in the direction of straight federalization anytime soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a sure. question from a student. Uh, you mentioned the potential for an unclear election result. Do you think there's mm -hmm. a possible scenario in which some form of civil war or unrest could emerge in the US? No, I don't, actually. I really don't. I think that that's, um, I mean, a lot of us have read the Barton Gellman piece in the Atlantic that laid out the, the, the ways in which um, you know, um, there could be chaos and attempts by domestic actors and interference. And I, um, I mean, I accept that that's possible, but I do think that there is a tremendous amount of, uh, that, that, that the domestic institutions are a counterweight here. Let me, let me cite two points. Um, and one is that, in late September, when the president suggested he might not accept the outcome of the election, um, the entire GOP leadership, beginning with uh, Senate Speaker Mitch McConnell, said there will be a peaceful transition if there is a clear election outcome. Now, footnote, if it's not clear, you know, we have things to discuss. That might not, that, that might not be the case. But that was an unusually um, fast and, uh, and um, orchestrated move. And the second point I want to make is that the leaders of the American military have made it crystal clear from early June, um, when the protests across the country began after the murder of George Floyd, and the 82nd Airborne was called to Washington and bayonets were issued to domestic police paramilitary units, um, the leadership of the US military made it very clear that they would not be a part of this. And in, in, with a forcefulness and a visibility that had not been seen in American civil military relations, I think of the history of the Republic. And 
I think that a great deal of, has a great deal of thinking about this kind of situation has been going on uh, within the 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 security institutions in the United States to make sure that um, unregulated militias would not be able to carry the day in such a situation. Very good. Um, another question by Randall. On the 750 billion debt relief, it is a major step forward, but is it enough? Do we need a complete banking union with common rules across the EU and a, Euro and a European Central Bank with powers equivalent to those of the Fed? Do you think the debt agreement is as far as Berlin will go, or rather that it's turning a point? A new German openness to substantial transfer of fiscal power and authority to the EU. Randall, um, again, that's another $60 million question. And, and I, I suspect it depends on how the pandemic develops. Um, I mean, the fact that Merkel's CDU and Merkel herself moved on this package and on European debt issuance is historic, is an extraordinary shift. Mm. And this could go either way. There could be a feeling in Berlin that's exhausted, that's exhausted the, per, the, the political capital that we currently have. Or we see, particularly I think if the, if, if the pandemic should sort of flatten out, which right now it's not looking like. Um, but I think if this takes another sort of severe downturn, um, there might be, you know, another, another reflection. But, but I, my, my, my sense is very much that as, don't forget that, that Merkel is in the last year of her fourth term, has firmly excluded running again, which I, and I believe her on that, and that um, there will be historic elections in Germany in the fall of 2021. And that I think the chancellor will be disinclined to make decisions of a weight and nature that her successor would have to execute and pay for without having had a voice in them. Is it, but that's a, you know, it's an educated guess. Again, it depends on how severe the crisis gets between now and, and, and in 12 months. Very good. Um, so I don't know, Constance, if you remember, but we actually met five years ago in Washington, D.C. at the German Marshall Fund, and it was definitely a different time back then. Oh, God. Um, and, uh, Six yes. months ago feels like a different time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And I have one question that I wanted to ask you myself again, which sure. is, one thing is, is clear, the Trump presidency certainly has not helped the transatlantic relationship. I think we, we would both unequivocally uh, agree on that. But how much structural damage has it done once we sort of disregard a lot of the noise um, around the Trump presidency? And I'm asking because there's already been quite a few transatlantic rifts before the Trump presidency, right? There was um, uh, the NSA scandal, disagreements over the Iraq war, uh, you know, failed TTIP, uh, a fading Cold War memory, a focus on uh, emerging economies. So how much structural damage has the Trump presidency done on top of already existing sort of transatlantic rifts of the past? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be the last one to deny that there were rifts under Barack Obama and under Bush. We all know that. But I do think that this is not just noise. Um, this is the first administration in living memory to question the foundational values of American constitutionalism. That's an extraordinary fact. There's no getting around this. There's no getting around the authoritarian leanings of the president, his endorsement or his refusal to not endorse hate groups or hate speech, his disrespect for the separation and balance of powers and the independence of institutions, his contempt for what he calls the deep state and other people would just call a government, and his 
continued, um, to use a Ponzi term, animadversions against minorities and women. These things are on display every day. And I think that that has contributed greatly to the polarization of American politics and to the degradation of American institutions and democracy. Or to quote my, my friend from the FT, Ed Luz, um, he began as a symptom and is rapidly becoming a cause. Now, is he also the expression of a larger societal, political, economic trend? Yes. But this is, but, but, but the, f the last four years have profoundly changed America and they have changed the world order in which we live. I think there is no way around that. Very good. Um, a question by one of my students. Um, it seems that every day there are more democratic norms being abandoned. Um, how, um, how many norms can be challenged before undermining good governance entirely? Um, before undermining good governance entirely and how thin is the ice? I'm sorry, I was just looking at, the, at some of the questions myself, uh, which are interesting. Um, can you do, do me a favor, repeat the question? Yes, of course. It seems that every day there are more democratic norms being abandoned. Mm -hmm. For example, Trump dogging questions about a peaceful transfer of power, Right. And so how many norms can be challenged before undermining good governance um, um, entirely? And how thin is the ice? Um, you know, I, I have to say that I think that American institutions and civil society in particular are remarkably resilient. Yeah. Um, sociologists um, have done the numbers on the, on the June and July protests um, that were set off by the George Floyd incident and some others, and noted that many of them happened in rural areas, in all white suburbs, and that, but that they were overall the largest and most diverse civil society protests the country had ever seen. I, f I find that truly remarkable, and they lasted for quite a long time. I think the country, and we can see this from the, from the, tur the voting turnout now, the country is remarkably mobilized. Um, it's also remarkably po polarized, but I think we're going to see historic turnout in this election. A historic meaning probably, um, by American standards, historic is between 60 and 65 percent, maybe even above that. I would be willing to bet that, in fact. And so that, I think, speaks to the country's democratic resilience. Um, but, you know, over time, institutions and people can be exhausted. They don't want to be heroic all the time. And the whole point of representative democracy is that it is supposed to be self-correcting. And that, and that institutions, the, 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 the idea of representative democracy is for people to be able to separate out the private life from the citizen life. You know, in other words, to not have to be citizens all the time. And if, if representative democracy doesn't fulfill that function, there's something wrong. And I think we're, we can also, you know, we would be kidding ourselves if we didn't say we see the sign, uh, signs of exhaustion. And I think that um, European history in particular, particular shows that these things can be a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, another question. What are the implications of the U.S. election, of the US, U.S. election result and the post-pandemic world for the relations uh, with the EU and Turkey in NATO and ostensibly seeking to join the EU? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the Turkey's attempts to join the EU have been, uh, those negotiations were put on ice years ago. And Erdogan's behavior does absolutely nothing to make anybody want to change that, which is regrettable, but that is the way it is. And, and Turkey's behavior is the conflict with Greece um, over energy sources in the Eastern Mediterranean is rapidly um, uh, becoming a, a very serious issue for NATO. So we... And the, 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 the problem is compounded by the fact that the current 
stop on mass migration into Europe from the war zones in the Middle East is guaranteed by the refugee deal between Merkel and Erdogan, which keeps, which, um, keeps refugees in Turkey at the price of billions of euros per year. And finally, by the fact that there are large Turkish diasporas in at least four European countries, of which Germany has by far the largest share, um, many of which tend to have, as is often the case with diaspora populations, tend to have more sharply pro, pro homeland and pro Erdogan views than maybe some of their families in Turkey would. That said, at the same time, you're now seeing second and third generation um, European Turks who, have, who are going the other way and who are saying, I want no part of this. I, I'm a German. I'm proud of my Turkish roots, but I'm a German and, I, and I, you know, I don't like this guy. I think it's also important to say, I was talking earlier about the weakness of Xi Jinping, um, you know, the, the, the brutality, the ruthlessness being exposed um, in, in, of, of, of Chinese warrior diplomacy. Uh, the defensiveness um, and the weakness of Putin's position. Now, the same thing is true of Erdogan. I think that I just the, the on, there was news on there was a piece in the Washington Post this morning that noted that Erdogan is currently prosecuting um, an, an academic uh, for uh, whom he accuses a Turkish academic whom he accuses of masterminding the 2016 coup together with an American scholar, Henry Barkey. That's just ludicrous. That's insane. If there, you know, if Erdogan has to grasp for that kind of straw, that's kind of like the president of the United States refusing to disavow QAnon in last night's debate. It, it is a sign of vulnerability and desperation. Okay, maybe two more questions before um, we end today's Damov lecture. Um, another one by Randall. Um, you've talked about the threat of populism from within. Budapest, Warsaw, and anti-immigration sentiment is the populist's oxygen. This mm -hmm. requires a common EU asylum policy. What are the chances, in your view, and should um, the Poles and Hungarians be ignored or compelled in developing a common solution? for asylum policy. Randall, you're asking all these hard questions. This better be a good dinner when I do come to Toronto. <laughs> but the, uh, no. Uh, the, I'm sure you know, um, although maybe not all of our listeners do, that the Europeans are currently trying to negotiate a common uh, migration policy and that the, the Hungarians and the Poles, among others, are very much holdouts on that. I don't really see that we have ways of compelling them directly. And, and frankly, I also think um, that the, um, it's worth remembering in Berlin and in the larger sort of central countries of Europe that, our that the peripheral nations of Europe are far more directly exposed to the impact of migra migration than we are. They are literally our buffer zones. Which is also why I, I still um, contend that Merkel was not just morally but politically right in 2015 to say we're not closing our borders. She didn't open them, she refused to close them. It's an important distinction. And, and to say if, but, but, but the argument was not just a moral humanitarian one but also one of responsibility and solidarity because it was clear that if Germany closed its borders there, the, the, the masses of refugees sort of piling up all the way up from Turkey and the Balkans would lead to huge public order crises in Europe's border nations. And so I am inclined to argue that um, the, the larger, more economically wealthy and powerful nations ought to um, volunteer to take on the sort of major burden of this. But, and that that would make it easier to say to the periphery nations, and we will do more for your border security, we will do more for US concerns, but for us not, but for us to be able to sell this to our own citizens, um, it would be very helpful if you could 
undertake to not oppose everything that we're trying to do here fundamentally and, and frame it in culture war terms of uh, Judeo-Christian battles against, against Islam, but, but say that you will, you will also take, take in a homeopathic doses and, and, go, and go with this program that we're developing, which is very far from being a one-size-fits-all um, sort of approach. That I, that, that, I think, to me, is a sane way of articulating this. Um, and I am, but I'm not sure that either... You know, the, the, th the thing is that both the peace government in Poland and Orban have gone to town on, on the sort of Judeo-Christian culture war narrative in ways that uh, very often have a, have a really disturbing um, anti-Semitic um, sort of underlying narrative that's very close to the surface and, and that I find profoundly disturbing and distasteful. And frankly, I think we should call them out on this much more often than we do. I would very much agree with that. And this uh, brings us to our last question, perhaps. Um, and if you would like to um, insert any final remarks um, on today's talk, um, feel free to do so now. Um, so how can we strengthen the transatlantic, ship, uh, transatlantic relationship again? And by we, I mean Canada uh, or and the EU and Germany. And how can we work towards a stronger transatlantic relationship in the future? And how optimistic are you that we can actually achieve that? Um. I tend to think that crises are really good for making under, us under all understand what matters. Um, it does kind of show you what the alternative is. And, and I, I, I don't know about you. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a couple. I've been, I've been in this business since the early 90s as a cup reporter. And then later, after about 15 years, a think tank analyst. And, you know, I've been to Rwanda in 94 and to Afghanistan in 2002 and to the Balkans and I've covered war crimes tribunals and I've, I've, seen, I've seen my share of really bad stuff. But this is a genuinely scary time. I don't think I've been as scared and felt as personally powerless and worried as I have in this phase. And it's not so much because of this sort of, you know, the invisible pandemic that could hit, hit us at any moment, but because of the, what, what seems to me a de decaying commitment and a sense of, of powerlessness with regard to our democratic operating systems, which to me define who we are and what we learned from World War II and the Holocaust. So, I think that I think that the crisis is severe enough to make us reevaluate where we stand and what we need to do. Um, and I do think, as Europeans, as I said, tried to say earlier, we have a great deal to offer. We are a trade superpower. We are a regulatory great power. And if we can make sure that our democracies do what they're supposed to do, we can keep the the authoritarians at bay. And, and I think that we can then, you know, deserve the aspiration of being a good partner to a, you know, benevolent, constructive, cooperative America. That's my take. All right. Thank you very much, Constanze. And this concludes our Damov lecture for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, tuning in. And I hope to see everybody soon. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And my special thanks to Mr. Damov, um, who I hope I get to, to, to the chance to meet soon. And as I say, I'm holding all of you to that promise of dinner in Toronto. I'll take the next plane if I can. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure.